feel like it mattered whether you understood or not, like you were a person. And as a grad student, usually you just feel stupid, so it was very nice. Um, and there was a lot of intuition that I got from Dennis about, about the subjects that I've been studying ever since, and of course the great theorems that he proved. Um, I want to tell a couple things. What, one, one, uh, for one example of the way of, of um, explanatory powers is there was uh, so so Thurston proved his geometrization theorem, which uh, is fairly well known. And even though a bunch of us were his students, we didn't we somehow didn't get the explanation of this theorem from Bill. Um, and we got some, but not we wanted to really know how it was proved. So we found these this collection of uh, of videotapes of, that uh, Dennis had of him lecturing on Bill's theorems. Um, it was conveniently in, in Betamax format. And we found some place in the university where we could see a Betamax tape. And we all trooped over there several days in a row uh, to just watch Dennis explaining how this theorem was proven. And it was, that was really the way I learned the way this works. Um, so that was one thing. And, another, and, and uh, I wanted to, to finish with one thought that one of the many wise remarks I learned uh, from Dennis about mathematics, and it was, he once said to me, I know I'm making progress when I'm generating one wrong proof a day. So, I've tried to keep that in mind. Okay, so, um, so I guess, so on the board here, I'm going to start with this picture on the board, which is, this is a graph. Um, that's my contribution to the contest, and then, um, what, there's something which goes with this graph, which is a pattern. The pattern that goes with this graph is the following. Take a torus, um, and you look at the set of all simple closed curves on the torus. Modular isotopy. Um, so I'll let me draw a couple. This one, this one. Um, and you can get, they get more complicated. You can have one which goes maybe around several times before it closes up. Um, and the simple closed, and the, the connection between the graph and the pattern is that uh, the vertices of this graph, so this red graph has vertices at various points on a circle, and it has edges, so it's a graph. Um, and every vertex here corresponds to a curve in this picture. So curves, these guys, um, correspond to vertices in this graph. And edges in the graph correspond to pairs of curves that intersect minimally. So what's the smallest intersection of between two curves on the torus is one, So, uh, if, they're, if they're not the same. So, um, so any pair of curves which intersects exactly one point in this picture yields an edge between the corresponding vertices in this picture. Okay, so this, thing, this graph is this famous thing called a fairy graph. Um, and you saw that the combinatorics of this graph showed up in, in John Hubbard's talks in Beautiful Construction, although this picture did not show up. Um, and I should say, one of the, the labelings are not crucial for this talk, but just so you see what the story is. The labelings correspond to the slopes of these curves. If you, if you make this into a straight torus, uh, flat torus, and you draw one of these curves in the torus, it'll, it'll have a slope. So for example, this curve has slope 2 over 1. Um, and the corresponding vertex is labeled by that slope. And so these are the, this gives an enumeration of the rational numbers. Anyway, so it's a well-known picture. Um, OK, so, so that's the pattern. And I should say before I go on that this same pattern appears in two other surfaces, the same exact definition works if, instead of the torus, you take a torus with one boundary component. It turns out the one boundary component doesn't change the discussion at all. So the same collection of curves show up in the same way, and so the same pattern. And another one, uh, so this is called S11. One, one. One, genus 1, one boundary component. This is S10. And here's the picture, the last picture, which gives us S04. And here, here are some of the curves. Here's the curve of slope infinity. Here's the curve of slope zero. Now, minimal intersection means that they intersect twice instead of once. Okay. Uh, so all these three surfaces have the same common torus, the set of simple closed curves. Um, so that's the 
sort of the, the classical version of this. Um, and I want to study some, uh, talk about the same construction in higher genus, actually, what it means. And now I have a confession to make. Um, I'm not going to quantize anything. And I'm not even, even going to confuse the homology group with anything. So, so what am I going to do? I, I want to study these sort of uh, graphs in, in the coarse geometry sense. I want to confuse coarse, coarse geometry of, of these pictures. And I want to sort of give applications to the study of hyperbolic three manifolds. So this, this is sort of, in, in some in strong sense, this is what's been interesting me all these years to think about hyperbolic three manifolds. And this two dimensional discussion is, in fact, forced on you to really try to understand certain questions about hyperbolic three manifolds. So I want to give you a feeling for how that works. So let's, let's start by what the general definition of the object I want is. So let S be any a surface of a finite type. So that means um, that means that it has finite, many finite genus and finite many boundary components. And I'm going to define the complex of curves of S. This is a simplicial complex. Um, so this is a simplicial complex of vertices. Same definition is up over there. Vertices correspond to simple closed curves on S, module like homotopy, uh, and K simplices. Well, there's there's a slight somehow these cases are, are slightly different from all other cases. So let me let me write down. But the edge the edges are the same definition, I guess. So let's say edges correspond to curves intersecting minimally. And I guess, well, you can maybe say the same thing. K simplices, well, that to be definitely fine. So K simplices correspond to curves to, uh, to K plus one tuplets, um, D0 to VK. Yeah, sorry, pairs of curves. Um, so the reason I'm tripping over my tongue here is the following. If you just look at just the edges, which is maybe, will maybe be, will be enough for us anyway. Uh, as soon as you have a bigger surface than the three I wrote here, uh, the minimal number of intersection, the minimum intersection number for two simple closed curves is zero. You can make them disjoint. So, so this definition becomes edges are pairs of disjoint curves. Yeah, there, there exists disjoint curves. So minimally means what's the minimal intersection number of all curves, pairs of curves in the surface. I'm just trying to get, a, get around the fact that, that here the number is 1, and here the number is 2, and here the number is 0 for the number of intersections without having to say too many words. Obviously, it's important. Um, and, but, now, but now that I know that in general I want to think about disjoint curves, I, I want k simplices to be uh, k plus 1 curves that are all disjoint. That, that's what this complex is like. So, um, it's just just for an example, if I think a genus two surface, then here here are three curves in the surface which make a triangle. Each curve is a vertex. They're all disjoint, so they make a two simplex. And I don't know. This curve here corresponds to a vertex which is disjoint from two of them. So, and, and uh, hits the third. So it looks like this. You know, label this as A. B, C, D, then um, A is here, B is here, C is here, D is there. That's a little, little tiny piece of this complex. Um, so this is an object. And it is, in fact, I should say, this, this object does show up in the study of moduli spaces of surfaces and mapping class groups. And it does, in fact, have some algebraic topology, which I don't know how to say. Anything, but, um, so what, what do I want to study about it? Horus. I'll try to leave the red picture up for a while. Um, so, I, so, so how do I study the, the, this object from the coarse geometry point of view? I make this. So I make every edge 
a unit interval. And this gives me, and I guess every simplex, a unit simplex, I should say. I'm going to mostly ignore the higher dimensional simplices for this talk. Um, make every edge a unit interval, I get a path matrix. Um, this complex. So it's just some simplicial complex. Note that uh, it's it's an infinite simplicial complex. There are infinitely many homotopy classes of simple closed curves on a typical surface. And it's also locally infinite. Every point has an infinite width. Um, on the other hand, it is, infinite, it is finite dimension. In fact, if I'm only going to look at the edges, then it's even more finite. So, um, so I, I have now this, this simplex, and I choose to study it as a metric space by giving everything a sort of standard metric. Um, and so let me start by giving you a theorem about this. So, this is uh, joint work with Howie Mazur. Um, yeah. um, so, under this, these definitions, C of S is delta hyperbolic. So, this is this is a definition due to Misha Gromov, um, which is supposed to mimic the some properties of hyperbolic spaces. Uh, trees, various things like that. Sort of a negative curvature condition. Um, let me give it a definition. So the definition is x is delta hyperbolic if for any triangle ABC we have the following condition. In any one of the sides, AB, say, is contained in a neighborhood of radius delta of the union of the other two sides. So the picture that goes with that is this. You draw any triangle in your space. So that means the triangle means a geodesic triangle. And any side is in a, the bounded neighborhood of the other two sides. So that means that somehow <coughs> any point here is a, bound, is a distance delta at most from some point. The, these guys are close to this side. These guys are close to that side. No point is far away from the union of these two sides. So in particular, so for example, the Euclidean plane is not delta hyperbolic from delta. Um, hyper, the hyperbolic plane is delta hyperbolic. It's an easy exercise. I always forget the constant delta. It's R cosh of root 3 or something. Um, and a tree, you know, another example is a tree. Take a metric tree um, like that. A metric tree of, say, infinite diameter. It's only interesting if the diameter is infinite. Um, that it's easy to see that, that every geodesic triangle in a tree has this property with delta equals zero. Okay, so that's the definition of delta hyperbolic. Um, I'm not going to talk about the proof of this theorem. It's not, it's not a particularly obvious proof. Um, so it's hard to sort of talk about it. Um, actually, if you, if you get bored with the rest of the talk, you can just prove that it's true in this case. That's easy in this case, but it requires some thinking. Um, okay, so. This, yeah, in this case, yeah, think just about the, yeah, the graph. You have this graph with, with uh, made of triangles like this, just, just, the, just the red edges. And that is in, it's not so hard to see that it has infinite diameter, which makes it much more interesting now. And then you have to prove that it's, it's delta hyperbolic with delta equal to um, 1 or something, maybe 1 and a half. Hmm? Yes, I know. Although you're allowed to be bored because you've heard this stuff. Okay, so that's that's a statement about the course geometry of this complex. Um, now I want to well, actually, let me let me make one more statement about the course geometry of this complex, and then and then I'll try to link it to hyperbolic geometry. So here's another theorem. Oh, let me just say, so when you have a delta hyperbolic space, um, if x is delta hyperbolic, then um, x has a boundary to infinity. Um, a generalization, so when you have the hyperbolic end space, the boundary at infinity is the sphere. When you have a tree, so let's say a, a three-valent tree, just to be definite. So you have a three-valent tree, then the boundary at infinity is a cantor set. 
So roughly speaking, it's the endpoints of, of geodesics going out to infinity. Um, it's a little bit more accurate to say the endpoints of, of uh, quasi-geodesics going out to infinity. Um, and in the case of a, of a locally infinite graph, this notion is a little more subtle and hard to work with. Um, in, in all the standard cases, the metropolitan space, this boundary is compact. The boundary of this space is not going to be compact. So here's the theorem about the boundary of this space. So um, this is a theorem to Eric Clarike, who is a proud alumna of uh, Stony Brook. So the theorem is this, that the boundary of infinity of this complex is, well, it's a certain space of lamination. Um, I, I guess I, I've been calling this space EL for reasons that might become obvious later. Um, you should think of it this way. It's, if you have a sequence of vertices going to infinity in this complex, then I, if you look at the, the curves on the surface that they represent, you expect the curves to get longer and longer and longer. And when curves on the surface get longer and longer and longer, if they're simple curves, they start to look like a picture sort of like this. Um, Here's a very long curve on the surface. And we trump the trick with these pictures and making them stop. I never quite get the hang of this. So you have to just keep going, and eventually the audience believes that maybe. <laughs> so here's here's a closed curve that's very long, um, and you see that when it, what happens to it is that it starts having long sections that run next to each other, um, and if you drew this as a hyperbolic geodesic in the surface and you made it longer and longer, then the limit would be a lamination. It would be a, well, actually, it's the same picture. Uh, if you squint a little bit, you get something which is made of lot of many, many leaves, geodesic leaves, all disjoint, uh, fitting together in some closed set. So that's, a la that's a geodesic lamination. It's, it's some subset of these which occurs as the boundary points of this complex. I should, for those who care, this is the, um, the laminations that occur are the filling laminations. So it's laminations which admit no, no other laminations in their complex. Um, and this topology on this set, which I'm not going to talk about, but this, what? They're not measured. They're, yeah, well, this, so, so, yeah, try not to, to avoid this issue, but these, you, you, these are not measured. You get the topology on them by, by starting with measured ones and then forgetting the measure. Um, that turns out to be the right topology, and that is the topology that this set inherits as the boundary of this space. Okay? So... Is that C of S, right? No, C of S is um, actually a uh, homotopy equivalent to a wedge of infinite wedge of spheres in dimension so about two two uh, no, one-third or so <coughs> of the length of spheres. That's a theorem of, of terror. Um, so it's not contractible. So actually, it's actually the, the hyperbolicity is interesting because the thing is not contractible, so somehow... It's not a local proof. Um, okay, so, so the picture is somehow is I have this complicated complex, which I don't know how to say much about. Um, it's got infinite degree at, 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 at all vertices. And then somehow it has this boundary, uh, infinity, which is made of laminations. That's the, the thing I want to talk about. Uh, it, I'll get a little more concrete about it in, in a little bit. So. So that's, that's the, some statements about the coarse geometry of this object. Now let me switch gears a little bit and talk about hyperbolic three manifolds. So what else can I do with surfaces in three manifolds? Suppose that n is a three manifold in a hyperbolic metric. So it's, it's the hyperbolic three space modulo in discrete group gamma PSL 2 C. Um, and if I have such a manifold, I can take it, and I have my surface, I could map it in there by some map. Um, let's think about a homotopy class of maps of a surface into a three manifold. Now, the reason I'm interested in these maps um, is well, there's this general principle that you learn in three manifold topology very early, which is that you can study a three manifold effectively by putting surfaces in it and seeing what they do. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm going to be a little more precise in a minute. But, um, but, but this is the idea. I want to understand what is the geometry of such. What can I learn about the three manifold by matching surfaces into it? 
This is the same now um, on the level of well, on the level of groups. This is the same as the representation in the fundamental group of S uh, into the fundamental group of N, which is gamma, and gamma is in here, the atomic group of H three. So I can just think about representations um, from the fundamental group of S into this Lie group, and and I should say that what I want to do. Uh, in, in, in a few minutes, is talk about how these things are classified. Um, and I'll restrict this greatly in a minute, the, the, the object, the one representation I'm going to talk about. But given any such representation, there's a length function on the, on the curve complex, actually on the vertices of the curve complex. So if you have, so any, take V in the zero skeleton of the curve complex, uh, so it's a, it's a it corresponds to a curve, so V determines conjugacy class in uh, pi 1 of S, uh, in free homotopy class of loops, actually modulo, which is important. Uh, and then rho takes a conjugacy class like this to a conjugacy class in PSL2C, and then that has a trace. I'm trying to sound algebraic, so I fit in. Um, so you take the trace of rho of B, I guess, let's think about it that way. Take the vertex, take the curve that corresponds to, apply rho to the conjugacy class, and look at the trace of all those matrices that you would get. It's all the same trace. Um, so it's a complex number. And actually, you can cook up from this trace, you can cook up a, a length of a, let's call it lambda, of lambda rho of alpha, sorry, of B. This is the complex length. So there's, there's a relation. One of these, this is the, related to the hyperbolic cosine of this. But this is this is a, a geometric quantity. It describes the action of the corresponding isometry in hyperbolic space. So I'll come back to that in a minute, what exactly this means. So I suddenly have this complex value function, lambda rho, from um, from the vertices of S of the of this complex into the complex numbers. And this is really what I want to study. Hopefully you'll see by the end why how this comes up. Um, and in fact, well, let me say that what, what is the geometric meaning of this? I don't think I'm really allowed to just pretend it's an algebraic discussion. Um, what is what is rho of what does an isometry in PSL to C do? So a generic isometry in PSL to C it looks like this. Here's hyperbolic free space, and such an iso such an element has two fixed points, and there's a geodesic line connecting them. And on this geodesic line, it acts as a translation. And it acts as a translation by some length L. Okay? And if you look at the orthogonal uh, plane to this geodesic, what happens to that plane? Well, it gets, as you move forward, it might get rotated. So the general motion is a screw motion, free space. So there's some, let's, so on, in, the, in the orthogonal direction, there's some kind of rotation by theta. That's the geometric picture. And lambda is L plus my theta. So in fact, it turns out what I'll be interested in, what the statements I'll end up making um, will be about the real part of this. But the whole thing is of interest. So this tells you the geometry of this group element. And if you're interested in understanding the geometry of this manifold, you're going to end up asking questions about these, about these complex lengths. So I'm gonna, that's what I sort of want to talk about eventually. Um, feeling for how we connect the combinatorics of this of this picture with the geometry of such a representation. Um, oh, and in, so now, in particular, let me, so let me, um, should I get the erase part just through? Um, so let me try to sort of focus on what is the question that I'm interested in answering about these representations. So, so, so let's, let's actually focus quickly on the following special case. Assume, um, Rho is injected. And so generally, it doesn't have to be any surface in a three manifold, it doesn't have to have a pi 1 injective image. And the map doesn't have to be injected on pi 1. But suppose that it is. And in fact, as soon as it is injected on pi 1, you could lift to a cover uh, of n corresponding just to the image of the fundamental group. So in fact, you might as well assume that it's surjective. So you might as well assume that um, on the level of groups, the image of this group in here is all you're looking at. I don't really care about the rest of the geometry. So, the, so what does that mean? That means that, let's call it n rho 
H3 mod rho of I1 of S is a manifold which is at least homotopy equivalent to S cross R. It's the same fundamental group as S. And in fact, it's actually a theorem that these, this is a, that there's a homeomorphism. Uh, this is work of uh, Bonnerholm and Thurston. This is the, the sort of fundamental work that starts off this whole field. I'm kind of reversing historical order. The, things in, the statement I'm going to end up with um, was formulated long before this complex of curves was fed into the picture. Um, okay, so I have this representation. And the thing I want to do, the, the, I would like to somehow study the way in which the asymptotic structure of n rho quotes, determines, well, this is the question, actually. Um, I would like to know if this is true. This is, I'll formulate this a little bit more precisely. So the picture you should have in mind is that n rho is, looks like a surface cross r, except the geometry is complicated. So I didn't say anything about what the geometry of the manifold is like. It has two ends corresponding to, to the two ends of r. I should say, uh, this picture is clearest when S is, is closed surface, and this really has two ends. When S has boundary, which, I, which is an important case, um, you have to make a relative version of all these pictures. You have to worry about the boundary, you can ignore that issue. So you just think about this long chimney with a hyperbolic metric on it, and it has some, you want to somehow encode the asymptotic geometry in, in each direction, and ask yourself, does that asymptotic geometry determine the whole manifold uniquely. And the reason this is an interesting question is that a positive answer essentially gives a uh, parameterization for the whole deformation space of these, of, of these uh, representations. And it, it's sort of an important ingredient of understanding what, what all the hyperbolic three manifolds are of a given topological type. Um, so I'm going to try to give you a window on this question, which is sort of um, tailored to this picture. Um, yeah. But if n has finite volume? Yeah. Well, if n has finite volume, then actually the hyperbolic structure is uniquely determined by its topological type, by master rigidity. So the, the question isn't quite, do we, is it determined in that case? Um, however, if, if you had a pi one injective surface immersed in a finite volume manifold, you could still take the cover associated to that group and you would still get an infinite volume manifold. And you could still ask the question about the infinite volume manifold. Um, but the real interest of this question is, is just, um, it's just representations that are given to you in this way. It's manifolds that start out like this, and you don't know anything else about it. Um, okay. so, so how do I relate the structure of my complex to this geometry that I proposed on the picture? Uh, let's look at, so remember we have this uh, function L sub rho, which is the real part of lambda sub rho, this, this, this real translation length which maps the vertices of S into, I guess now it's the real part of R. In fact, if you, if you set it up right, it's positive numbers. Um, so I want to study this function. And in particular, let me, so let me sort of make another statement which follows from this, this uh, theory of Bonham and Thurston. Suppose I look at um, L rho inverse of 0 L. So this is all vertices whose length in the manifold is less than equal to L. Just a sub-level set of this function. So here's my mysterious complex with its mysterious boundary infinity. And on this, in this complex, I have a function. And I just look at, let's look at the sub-level set. So there's some set, this guy, of, of, of vertices whose lengths are bounded by L. And I want to understand that set. Uh, so here's a statement about that set. This thing has, at most, two accumulation points. Um, on the boundary of the thing. So the picture is, and, and the, in, in interesting cases, it's exactly two, and I'll, I'll sort of draw the rest of the picture if it's exactly two. So the picture is kind of like this, it's like a, somehow as you go off to infinity in this Romov boundary, you, you accumulate on one point, perhaps, and perhaps on another point, but no more. 
Um, let's give them names. Plus and minus. Um, in this picture I drew here of the two ends of the manifold, new plus and new minus are associated with the asymptotic geometry of the two ends. And I should say again, that when Bohm and Thurston proved this theorem, they did not prove it in this uh, terminology at all. This terminology is sort of my point of view on it, I guess. Um, but anyway, that's the context. And, and so now the question, let me sort of state a conjecture. So this is called the ending lamination conjecture. This is due to Thurston as a conjecture. Um, so new plus and new minus, assuming that they're, that, let's, let's restrict ourselves to the case where there's exactly two points on this boundary. So these, and these are, remember, these are laminations, hence the, the term ending lamination. Um, these two points determine rho uniquely. Um, well, uniquely is, how unique can it be? Well, it has to be up to conjugacy in PSL to C. Because obviously, you take the whole thing and apply it to the global isometry. Um, okay, so that, that's, the, that's this uh, conjecture, which is um, sort of a central conjecture because, it, it, again, it, it tells you that you have a parameterization of the space of representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could say, right, a, a way to avoid this issue is to say they determine the three manifold uniquely. Except I, I don't just want the three manifold, I want the three manifold together with this homotopy equivalence of n. In other words, it's a, it's a marked three manifold, not just a three manifold. So you have to say something annoying, no matter how you say it. So I want to talk about how you approach this conjecture and tell you, give you some partial results. If I'm lucky, I'll just say something. Um, so how do you approach, how do you determine uh, such a thing uniquely at the kind of I guess it, um, I should say, I mean, somewhere in here, is bound to be a theorem of Sullivan. There is. So here's the theorem of Sullivan. So let's state it in a special case. If gamma 1 and gamma 2 are Kleinian groups, so that means just uh, discrete subgroups of PSL2C, so the same groups we've been talking about. Um, let me put a technical condition. So I don't have to worry about this issue with no domain, well, let's say the limit set equal to the whole Riemann sphere. So, you should, if you don't know what this condition means, you should ignore it. But it applies to the setting I have. Uh, and gamma, well, let's say, suppose that gamma 2 is given, um, is, is conjugated to gamma 1, where phi is a quasi-isometry of H3. So I have two groups, and suppose that they're the same up to, if I say a bi Lipschitz mass of H3, then, in fact, uh, gamma 2 and gamma 1 are conjugate in the lower sphere. So you missed the steer, there's a quiz on the steer. Um, I was thinking about it, man. Okay, good. Okay, so, there's, so this theorem says that if you, if you take this, these groups, there's no, there really aren't any interesting quasi-asymmetric deformations to these groups. If you can show, if you have two groups and you're wondering if they're the same, then all you have to show is that they're roughly the same. And then you know that they're the same by this theorem. This is good news for me because all I can ever do is show that things are roughly the same. I don't think I've ever shown anything that's exactly the same as anything else. So, um, so that means that we have to do the following thing to understand our manifolds here. Um, So we would like a model manifold. Um, so it's supposed to be our, uh, uh, describe our hyperbolic manifold. A model manifold that depends uh, only on the asymptotic data, on these endpoints in infinity. But, which is guaranteed to be bi Lipschitz or quasi asymmetric. Um, 
to our hyperbolic now. So the logic is, again, somebody, you have rho, you cook up from rho these two numbers, mu plus and mu minus, which are promised to you by this uh, theory of Bonham and Thurston, uh, their laminations. And then, by a certain process, you generate a model manifold, let's call it M, which only depends on this data and doesn't depend on rho. And then, you somehow would like to um, show that your original manifold here was actually modeled well by this one. And if that was true, then, then you prove the, this conjecture, because if you had then, of course, had a rho prime, which produced the same lamination, then you would get the same model, and therefore the two manifolds would be quasi-asymmetric, and by Dennis's theorem, they would actually be the same. So, um, so, the, so that's the goal. The goal is to somehow understand the, the hyperbolic geometry coarsely just from this combinatorial data. Okay. Um, no, no, it's going to be, so topologically, it will just be a copy of S cross R. Um, but it will have some metric on it, and the metric is the point. So I'm somehow give it a metric structure, and it doesn't matter much what it is, it needs to be, I mean, what I will end up generating is sort of a piecewise smooth no, no, no. So gamma one and gamma two are finding groups. So the, the idea here is that let, let me let me finish this diagram. If I had if I had a different representation, then here I would have a different hyperbolic manifold corresponding to rho prime. And these two cleaning the two cleaning groups associated with these two manifolds are both modeled by the same model, and therefore they're they're quasi symmetric to each other. And then you apply solving. The model is an intermediary between two kinds. No, no, that's a good question. Yeah, so then it's asking if I if do I expect these things to sort of look like sort of like a bounded picture where everything's kind of like a big chimney? And the answer is not at all. This is in fact the whole issue is, is that what these things really look like um, is sort of a cancerous growth thing. There's like big tubes big solid tori called marbulus tubes that are kind of in the, here, here's sort of a typical picture of one of these manifolds. It's like big solid tori all over the place with, with very large diameters. In case of bounded, so, so right, so there's going to be right, there's a case which I haven't said what it is. There's a case of where you have some kind of bounded combinatorial structure here. And then, in that case, you know that the manifolds look about as tame as possible. They look like um, some of the geometry every place is in a compact set of pictures, and there aren't these big tubes of arbitrarily bad diameter, arbitrarily large diameter. Uh, but if you want to understand everything, you somehow have to understand um, the main issue, in fact, turns out to be to understand how, how are Margulis tubes um, distributed in this manifold? What's the pattern in Margulis tubes? And I should, so, um, so for, so for people who know a lot about gauge theory, they probably don't know what a Margulis tube is. So, uh, so a Margulis tube shows up as follows. If you have a very short geodesic in your manifold, in your hyperbolic manifold, um, then there's a, th there's a theorem of Margulis that says that, su that such a short geodesic admits a very large solid torus neighborhood. There's a collar around any short geodesic whose, whose radius grows, goes to infinity as the geodesic length goes to zero. Um, and somehow outside this solid torus, um, the curve cannot be realized. The homotopy class has a definite lower bound on its, on its length, and, and it can only get short by being inside this tube. It's a three-dimensional analog of, um, of the standard collars in a hyperbolic surface. Every short curve has a long, long, long collar around it of sort of standard shape. Okay, and and. The Margulis tube in three, three dimensions is sort of similar, except instead of an annulus, you get a solid torus. So these are the things that are hard to understand. So I want to give you, in fact, in the time left, good question. Yeah. So, so in the time left, I want to, I want to, I want to describe a model of this in a special case. So I want to do a completely um, explicit picture of what a model of this looks like in one case, and I want to claim. Well, I want, I, I'll try to claim things about it, but I probably won't prove anything. So. So let's focus on one surface. So, 
but let, let the surface be the surface of genus zero with five boundary points. So it looks like this. Sort of the first um, interesting example of this discussion, pretty much. Um, so it has boundary, and I didn't tell you what happens. I, I sort of, there's a technicality involving the boundaries, which uh, you're free to worry about, too, but, but I'm going to try to ignore it. Um, but but let's, let's sort of say, first of all, what is the complex in this case? Let's think about it for a minute. Um, the dimension of the complex, so it's a, in the class answer what the dimension of the complex is in this case? It's actually, um, so, so the, the maximum number of disjoint vertices you can have at once is two. Here's an example. So these two vertices are disjoint. You can't put anything else in here that isn't parallel to the boundary. I should say that I'm excluding things that are parallel to the boundary. Um, I didn't say that before. So this corresponds to an edge in this complex, and, and that's all it has, edges. Um, so it's a graph again, but, but more complicated than this. And there is this. So I'm going to try to build a model in this case. So the first thing to observe about this thing is if you take any vertex, then its complement is actually, what is it? So take the, the complement of, of a curve in this surface, you get one thrice punctured sphere and uh, a disjoint union with a four, four times punctured sphere. There's the thrice one and there's the four times punctured sphere in the complement of this curve. Uh, so this one is not interesting. If you think about this one, there's no curve complex at all. So we're going to ignore this one, and we'll call this one W sub V. Because it's, in, it's the interesting part of the complement of V. Um, and inside W sub V, if you look at, so, so let's just notice that if you draw V in this complex, and you look at all its neighbors, everything, everybody, everybody disjoint from V, what does that look like? Well, any two guys that are disjoint from V live in W sub V, and so they must intersect. So there are no edges joining them in the complex. However, we should remember that, that inside W V we have this original fairy graph, and I want to draw that in here. So let's so this neighborhood, this one neighborhood of V is described by so in here there's this fairy graph with all well, with the various edges of the fairy graph. This, this whole thing is the original fairy graph I drew in the beginning. So I'm drawing the edges in red because they're not part of C of S, but they are part of C of W. So in this picture, C of W is not, in, is not really, the edges of C of W are not really part of C of S. It's kind of a special case, actually. But I want to think about them anyway, so I'm drawing them in red. So here's, there, that's the picture of S05. Well, that's the local picture, of course. As soon as you try to understand what happens more globally, uh, it's very, very difficult. If you, start, if you try to try to understand what is the sort of neighborhood of radius 2 look like, neighborhood of radius 3, and so on, um, you could be run into a lot of, a lot of trouble. The people in this room would probably do that and know what I'm talking about. Um, but at least the one neighborhood is understandable. OK, so now I want to use this structure to build a model for, for a three manifold. Um, and that will probably take me the rest of the time. So, okay. so how do I do that? So remember that we have this sort of draw in the abstract again, C of S, with, we are given two points at infinity, like this. And so for step one, connect mu plus to mu minus by the geodesic. Let's call it G. So I want to line like this to the geodesic. So it's got, it's an infinite geodesic. It's going to these points at infinity. This is already a theorem. You need to know that there exists such a geodesic. It's not so obvious that it exists. Uh, again, because, because of the local infinite nature of this complex, it's not so obvious that you can find geodesics. Usually you get things like this by taking limits, but limits work well when you have local finiteness. Anyway, so believe me that this step can be done. Um, and then, step two, is the following. Now, now I want a local construction which looks like this. Let's draw this geodesic again. Let's look at um, three adjacent vertices in this geodesic. So let's call them um, U, V, and W. Okay? So what does this look like in the surface? Well, we have this 
picture again. So here's my shorthand picture of the surface. Here is uh, perhaps V. And U and W are disjoint from V, right? If they, if they have edges, then the curves are disjoint. And so here's, here's U, perhaps. And then W is elsewhere in this, in this surface, inside W sub V. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard to draw. It sort of goes in. Perhaps it's very complicated. So maybe that's uh, W. So U and W are vertices in the zero skeleton of the complex of curves of W sub B, which you remember is the fairy graph. Okay? So what do I want to do next? I want to add structure to this picture. So the structure is I will take U and W and connect them with the GW. Connect U to W by geodesic. Uh, let's call it H sub V, because it depends on V. And we'll draw it in red because it's made of red edges. So now it's a finite geodesic. With perhaps many vertices in it. It connects this to this. So that now any two successive vertices in this red path um, are, well, it's, it's, it's a path now in this graph that lives over W. Um, and any of them are, are disjoint from V. They're all living in W sub V, so there's actually edges, white edges like this. So that's the picture, this little wagon wheel like that. Okay. Andre can finish the talk. Right. All right, so, uh, so I did this at one place. I can independently do this everywhere. So I can do it, um, well, let me sort of draw a the picture there. So. A few of them, many, uh, minutes. So I could do this everywhere in this <coughs> picture. Um, so each of these is sort of independent of, of the previous. They are, the lengths are some numbers, which one can actually, there are ways to estimate what the lengths of these things can be. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, but it's, well, and, and the other thing I should say is that you, usually at this point, somebody worries about whether this is. Uh, uniquely determined by what I started with, uniquely determined by, by these points. Uh, and the answer is no, it's not. Actually, there are some choices when you connect these things with geodesics. These are not, they're not unique geodesic points. Um, so there are choices, but the choices don't matter, it turns out. Um, and, and, and any set of choices will yield the construction that I can talk about. So I just want to, so let's just fix a uh, thing like this. I usually, uh, this, this is actually, I should say, still joint work with Howie Mazur. This, the existence of these things, uh, they're called hierarchies. I don't know if this is a very good name, but we didn't come up with a better one. Because hierarchies have other meanings than three manifolds. Anyway, this is a hierarchy of geodesics. In the, in the general case, um, this starts to get much harder to define. That's why I'm, that's why I'm restricting this special case. In higher genus, this, just defining this takes an hour, so I'm not going to do that. Um, okay, so, so this is an object. Now I have to, I guess, in the, in the for the rest of the talk, I will describe how to build a three manifold out of that pattern. Okay? And then and then I will assert that this three manifold uh, has something to do with the hyperbolic three manifold, but I don't think I'll be improving. Maybe I'll get this just state here. Okay, so so now let's call this thing H. Higher H. So I want from H to get to um, the three manifold M. So it's going to be a three manifold with boundary. It's not going to be S cross R. It's going to be S cross R with a bunch of holes taken out of it, which correspond, are supposed to correspond to those tubes that you in a three manifold. So let's, let, let's just do it. Um, the way I'm going to do it is this. Every edge, every red edge is going to correspond. So a red edge will correspond to um, a block. And then, um, and then there will be gluing. Gluing structure all these blocks. And when we glue them all together, we'll end up with a three manifold. And, then, and I think actually it, it's, it's just worth maybe even paying attention just for this thing. If you get a nice picture, you can go home with a nice picture in your head, even if, even if you don't care what type of ball. So, um, so let's, de let's describe it. So every red, what is a red edge? So let's, let's take a red edge. Here's one. Oh, to anybody who was there, I, I gave some lectures on this a month ago here, and I apologize for everybody who was there because the edges were yellow. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so here's, here's an edge E. And it has two vertices. Uh, there's a left and a right side to this. So let's call the, the left hand vertex E minus and the right hand vertex E plus. Okay. I guess in the last talk it, it was uh, start and, and, and S and Q. Um, okay. So what else is associated with E? Well, E is, uh, there's some vertex V here, right? So there's, there's, a su there's a surface WV, which is a four-hole sphere. Now let's also call it, let's just call it WE, because E, once you know E, you know V. So W E as well. So this is a four-hole sphere. Let's go right. And these two uh, vertices correspond to two curves in here, which intersect minimally, which means twice. So E minus, let's draw it. Let's say that E minus is like this, E plus looks like this. So I'm drawing them so that they have, I'm drawing them so they're not too long. But any, of course, any choice of E minus and E plus will topologically give us pictures. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's the configuration associated with this edge. And I'm going to thicken each of these, pick an annulus neighborhood of each of these things. Okay, let's, so let's call this one collar of E plus, and this one's collar with E minus. And I'm going to build the following three-dimensional object. So I'll actually write the definition down, even though it's kind of incomprehensible when you write it. Uh, let's take the block associated to E is the following thing. Take the surface and cross it with the interval. Let's write uh, the negative 1 comma 1. But now you've thickened it. And now remove from this two solid tori. Remove from it the collar of uh, E plus cross the interval of one half comma one, and remove from it the collar of E minus cross the interval um, negative one comma negative. So this is an annulus cross an interval, so it's a solid torus. This is also a solid torus. One of them is on top, one of them is on the bottom. So roughly what I've done is this. Let me sort of give you a caricature of this. This is W. Uh, the surface of W sub E, then I have the interval. And then on the top, I've taken my this annulus across this sort of short interval, not, well, not all the way through, but just maybe a quarter of the way through. And I've cut that out like this. Okay. This is where all those long hours in high school art class are supposed to pay off. So when I do it on the other side, I'm using the, the, the E minus curve, so it's transverse to the first one. Everybody see what that picture is? Sort of cut out this and this. Uh, in, in fact, by the way, if you if you want to get the exact topological object, you can take this one, you can remove neighborhoods of the vertical edges, and then double this thing along the vertical boundary. You'll get exactly this object. But, but just schematically, think of this as the fourfold sphere cross I minus these two things. And another, another schematic picture, even more schematically, um, I'm going to draw it like this. Okay, so here imagine that this, this is the level surface, which is W, W sub E. And here I've, I've gotten rid of one solid torus, and this one represents the other solid torus going like this. Okay, so th that's a block. Um, it has top and bottom boundaries. Let's start with this one. So, um, the top boundary of this block is two three-hole spheres. And the bottom boundary is two three-hole spheres. Also, you just, if you look at this thing, the top looks like this four-hole sphere, and you remove the annulus. You've dug away the annulus, so it's left the three, two three-hole spheres. And the bottom is the same structure, the two different three-hole spheres. Okay, so now, what's the, what's the plan? So now M will be um, the union of all these blocks over all the edges in the hierarchy, all the red edges in this hierarchy. Take all the blocks, and then you glue them, glue along these plus or minus boundaries whenever possible. In other words, if I have two blocks, I mean, what I mean by that is that if I had, suppose I had two blocks like this and like this, 
And suppose it turned out that this three-hole sphere and this three-hole sphere are the same. I'll just glue them. Yeah, well, so in fact, there are three different, in this, in this case, there are three different gluing configurations. So I'll, I'll try to describe them uh, briefly. So the easiest gluing configuration looks like this. If you have two edges, this one and this one, the red one, take two adjacent red edges, like this, here, then the, the W is the same surface, and you have, and, and this, this common vertex, the both of them appears in the bottom of one block, and in the um, top of the other block. So here's the block of E2, say, and block E1. And you just glue this to this and this to this. So you end up like this. So suddenly you, you've melted them together and there's still an empty solid torus like that. Uh, so that can happen. If you have a lot of these in sequence, you'll get a sort of sequence of blocks like this. So that, can, that kind of glue can happen. Um, and there's two other configurations that could be problem. Um, there's this picture. E1 and E2 like that, let's say. And there's this picture. So E1 and E2. So this comes like that, and this goes like this. Okay? Uh, so let me try it. Let me. How much time do we have? Negative three minutes? Or? So. Alright, so let me. Let me. Let's see. Let me. Let me, try to do. Let, me let me try to do this one. So what does this look like? Let me quickly draw this picture. So here's, here's the vertex B and here's the vertex B prime. That are di that the, and so I have the following picture on the fivefold sphere. So B and B prime are disjoint. And what are the domains of these, of these two blocks? Well, the, the block on the top here is in the complement of V. So that means. Uh, this thing, WB, is the surface associated, associated with this block, and WB prime is this four-hole sphere associated to that one. And if you look at these three three-hole spheres, um, so these two show up in this surface, and these two show up in this surface. Right. So there are two overlapping four-hole sphere here um, with this common three-hole sphere in the middle. Um, so if you think about what happened, you see that uh, the what happens here? You have block the block associated to E1 will have two of these, I guess uh, two and three, Y2 and Y3, and the block associated to um, E2 will have Y2 and Y1. Just like that. Y1 and Y3 are disjoint on the surface. So I'm drawing them on opposite sides of this picture. And then I glue these together. Okay? And the third picture, well, the third picture is a little harder to draw, but it sort of looks like this. Um, so maybe this is B. Like this. And now, if you look at, you need to know what these two guys are, but roughly speaking, the, the top of well, not this one, sorry. You need to know about these two. Like there's U and there's W here. This edge takes place in the complement of U, and this one takes place in the complement of W. Um, so the picture is roughly this. U might be over here someplace, and W might be over here someplace, you know, the five-fold sphere. So now here are the surfaces. There's Y1, uh, there's um, Y2, and there's Y3 this way. So there's a picture. So it turns out that the top of, I'm going to probably get the numbering wrong, but the top of the first edge, the edge, the, the block looking at this edge has, say, y, it's three, um, y1 and y2 in it. And then the block, the, that's on the top of one block, and the bottom of the other block is a picture that's sort of like this, y1 and y3. And y2 and y3 are not the same subsurface, so you can't glue them, but you can glue these two together, so you do that. So these are the three local pictures. Now it turned out, turns out that they all fit together in a nice pattern. The pattern looks roughly like this. Let me sort of try to draw it. It's sort of a, it's, it's just like this kind of wagon wheel. It, well, I'll draw maybe a little bit of it. So here's here's a block. 
and then there might be another block like this that you glue this way, and there will be a block that you glue to this one. Now, in order to get the gluing to fit on the blackboard, I'm going to have to stretch the picture, even though geometrically it will not in fact stretch these things. Here's a picture like this. Now, from this block, you might start making type 1 gluings like that for a while, and then eventually you'll hit a block of glue up here, like that. So you get a lot of solid tori in here, all sort of in running in parallel to this big long solid torus here. So all these rectangles are, are missing solid tori in this, in this panel. And then it happens again. Over here, uh, these guys start to, um, the wagon wheels go on opposite sides of the picture. So you get sort of a wagon wheel like this, and then there's one over here which glues all the way to here. <coughs> And then, so that, that's the rough picture. You get these long ones and a lot of short ones going next to them. And then you get a long one on this side with a lot of short ones going next to it, and so on. So there's a specific, very specific combinatorial pattern that occurred. And so you end up with this manifold. Um, maybe in the last 30 seconds, I'll, make it, I'll state a theorem about it. So this, this thing, M, admits a uh, standard metric, first of all. The, the, well, that's not a theorem, but that's a definition. The metric is uh, make all blocks isometric, roughly speaking. I mean, all these blocks are combinatorially the same. So pick one copy of one of these blocks and fix it, give it a metric, make it so that all the three whole spheres on the boundary are all the same, are isometric. And then every one of these blocks in the picture, they're topologically different, but they admit a, a natural um, identification with your one nice model block, which I'll sort of draw over here, but with some fixed geometry. So all of these get identified to this block, and then the gluing maps are consistent with the identification. So you sort of pull back a metric to each one of these blocks, even the weird ones that are drawn here. I actually identify that with a standard block. And I glue them all together. And then I get a metric on this thing. Okay? And th there's a... So I'll just make... What? Yeah, that's right, actually. Yeah, these guys have to bend around. Just, if you s squeeze these together, then these guys are forced to bend around. Right. Um, and so there's a... You know, I mean, actually, I mean, yeah, this whole thing embeds in S cross R, I should say. And each of these things can be filled in by solid torus, but I'm not going to give you the metric on the solid torus. There is a canonical choice of metric for the solid torus. But I want to only talk about this part of the manifold, which is the exterior of all these solid torus. And then the theorem is that this admits a map into our map, the hyperbolic manifold. So there exists a map like this, which is Lipschitz, the uniform uh, constant. Um, and it also, let's just say that it respects uh, the solid torus, the solid torus. Well, maybe instead of respecting them, let's say that it takes the solid tori to more blue spheres. So I, I should say this maybe more carefully, um, but so the map, the, the, the hyperbolic manifold has all these tubes in it, and each one corresponds to one of these solid tori. I mean, Lined a little bit about, about the special cases anyway. But all, all these big tubes get mapped to big Margulis tubes. The yeah, the boundary, correct. But I don't have the interiors yet. I can extend that. It extends to the interiors, but, I, I don't, but, it, but then I don't want to say anything about the geometry. Um, so the Slipschitz map takes the boundaries of the solid tori to the boundaries of the Margulis tubes with, with degree one. Right. So it's sort of it's homotopic to a homeomorphism on each one. Um, so in some sense, it tells us, it, it fact picks out for us, now the combinatorics are picking out for us where, which solid tori, which Margulis tubes exist in this three-manifold. There's a bounds in some direction on this, you see, because of the Lipschitz condition. It's Lipschitz. So the conjecture is that it's, the conjecture is that there exists a bi-Lipschitz map. Um, and that, that would imply that we have a model that we want. If you have a bi-Lipschitz map, then it turns out you can actually extend it to the right thing on all the solid tori, and everything is wonderful, you know exactly everything. Well, this, this map is not, um, no, this, this map is not likely to be by the specific instruction. But all that really matters about it is, that, and you can sort of, you're allowed to fix it by homotopy. So there's a deformation of this map, which still has all these nice properties, but it's in fact by um, That's all you need. So this, so this is, this is a theorem, this is a conjecture, although 
uh, there are some ideas about how to do this. Yeah, the case, yeah, so the case, yeah, this certainly gives a proof, yeah, in that case, actually, it's, it's, uh, this does give a proof. So, the case, the case of bounded inductivity radius um, corresponds to the case where, well, I think said, somehow bounded combinatorics of these, um, this picture, in particular, the number of, of little guys around each big one is bounded. And there's a little bit, of, so there's something else. There's something, there's some combinatorial data associated to each of these solitaria, which I haven't told you about today. Some kind of twisting coefficient for each of these, which is sort of hidden in this picture. If all those things are bounded, then the manifold has bounded utility radius and vice versa. And in that case, um, in that case, the, the conjecture holds. It's written up. So this, this is actually just currently getting written up. The bounded geometry case actually is a, is a Stony Brook preprint. This, more, this Lipschitz thing is, um, is a collection of files on my computer. I, I should stop it. Then everything, yeah, then you can prove everything. Then, then it's simple enough that, that, that it's, yeah. That it's